Good evening, everyone. My name is Erin Laurie, and I'm the Executive Director of the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. Thank you for joining us for the fifth installment of our webinar series. And tonight's topic is water quality. Um, same as previous webinars, if you have any questions throughout the night, um, you can type them into the Q&A box that you should see on your screen, and then your questions will pop up on my screen, and uh, hopefully I'll have a few minutes at the end to answer some questions. Now, before we get started, um, I'd like to take a minute and thank our sponsors. Um, so our citizen science program called Coast Watchers and this webinar series are both supported financially by Bruce Power and RBC. So thanks to them, um, this is happening tonight. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with us, but for anyone new who's joining us tonight, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Coastal Center and what we do. Um, so we are, um, we were founded in 1998 and we're a registered charity working to protect Lake Huron through our science-based restoration, education, and research projects. And uh, we have a small but mighty team of three staff in the office and uh, we're overseen by a dedicated volunteer board of directors. And we also work with several consultants and advisors and we often have uh, co-op students and interns with us throughout the year. So you heard uh, from one of our interns uh, last week who was uh, with us for the summer. She did our Species at Risk webinar. And uh, we're a pretty unique organization in that we get to spend 100% of every single day on Lake Huron issues. So that's uh, pretty exciting. Now Lake Huron, it's the second largest of all the Great Lakes and it ranks as the fourth largest lake in the world by surface area. Its average depth is around 195 feet and the maximum depth of Lake Huron is uh, 750 feet. Now, if you look at the shoreline, including all of our islands, we actually have the longest shoreline of the Great Lakes, just over 6,000 kilometers. Lake Huron has a residence time of 22 years. So this means that if Lake Huron were to become seriously contaminated, it would take around 22 years for the lake to recharge or replace its water. So that means one little droplet of water spends 22 years in our lake. And uh, this of course is a huge concern because Lake Huron is the drinking water source for over one and a half million people looking at both the Canadian and US sides. So this means that protecting the water quality of Lake Huron is absolutely critical. Impairments of nearshore water quality in the Great Lakes, especially in Lake Erie, uh, have been a major public concern in recent years. Um, beach postings, algae fouling, these have all been frequent observations and uh, there's been a lot of media attention on the issue that's raised the level of concern. So let's talk about some of the different threats to Great Lakes water quality. But first, I just want to talk about what, um, what are the different types of pollution out there. Uh, so we have point source pollution and non-point source pollution. Now, point source pollution is a single identifiable source of pollution. So this might be a pipe or a drain, uh, industrial waste um, that's commonly discharged into rivers and the sea and the Great Lakes. Um, and then non-point source pollution is um, more uh, difficult to attribute to a single source. It usually impacts a wide area and it might be associated with a particular type of land use like urban areas or agriculture. And uh, runoff is a type of non-point source pollution. So when it rains, Runoff can pick up materials from the land um, before it enters our storm drains and before it enters local water bodies. And uh, something we need to be mindful of is that uh, the effects of climate change on surface runoff. And uh, so we're looking at more intense and more frequent storm and rainfall events. And uh, those events are creating challenges for our stormwater management systems. And uh, this often results in negative water quality issues. So we need to be ready to adapt to climate change and uh, 
work to improve the quality of both our urban and rural runoff to protect our water quality. So these goals are something that we all really need to be striving towards. So nutrients are compounds that stimulate plant growth. So this could be nitrogen, phosphorus, and in high concentrations, these nutrients can become both an environmental and a human health hazard. Um, nutrients in polluted waters, they can come from quite a few different sources. Uh, so this could include uh, agricultural fertilizers, septic systems, home lawn care products, and uh, yard and animal waste. And uh, in rural areas in particular, um, septic systems, farm field runoff, and livestock operations are major contributors uh, to nearshore water quality issues. So the better uh, that we're able to manage these systems, the better our water quality is going to be. And uh, something that, uh, that's an issue with nutrients is that it can contribute to algae growth. So algae is natural in the Great Lakes. Um, Clodophora is a naturally occurring type of algae and it provides shelter and food uh, to a wide variety of organisms. But um, sometimes we're seeing larger amounts of algae and seeing large amounts of algae usually indicates that we have excessive nutrients present. So we might have an ecological imbalance, which is an issue. Now, in last week's webinar, we talked about invasive species. So we talked about um, zebra mussels and uh, quagga mussels. And uh, hopefully you had a chance to uh, to catch that webinar, but um, if not, we're going to be posting all of our webinars online at the end of the series, so you'll be able to find them on our website, and uh, we will be sending out an email letting people know how they can uh, log in and watch all the webinars if, uh, if you like. Um, so like I said, we've been mentioned before as uh, zebra mussels and quagga mussels, and um, one of the issues with these invasive species is they can actually increase the amount of algae in the lake since um, they filter the water, they're filter feeders, and they make it um, make the water clearer, so that means that sunlight can then reach further down. And uh, they can also fertilize the algae with their uh, nutrient-rich excrement. And um, their hard shells actually provide um, a surface for algae to grow on as well, similar to uh, algae growing on rocks. And uh, sometimes storm waves will uh, break off large chunks of this algae and then wash it ashore. So um, yeah, these uh, invasive zebra and quagga mussels are, are actually contributing to this problem, which is uh, kind of interesting. Lake Erie. Um, Lake Erie provides more than 11 million people in the U.S. and Canada with drinking water. It's home to over 130 fish species and uh, it supports Ontario's economy, of course, through the tourism, agriculture, manufacturing and fishing industries. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen in the media a lot lately that uh, harmful and nuisance algal blooms have been increasing in Lake Erie over the past decade or so. And uh, this is causing serious impacts to the environment and uh, to the economy. So uh, we're actually seeing a harmful type of algae called blue-green algae or cyanobacteria and that's been found in the western basin of Lake Erie and this is creating significant concern since this type of algae in particular causes risks to human health and the health of wildlife. Now, um, blue-green algae, they have a really uh, specific appearance. So if you're seeing a dense uh, bloom that's kind of bluish to green in color, um, and the consistency can so sometimes resemble like a pea soup, um, that might be blue-green algae. And uh, if the blooms are very large, they might form large clumps in the water. And uh, a new bloom of blue-green algae might also have a smell that's kind of like fresh mown grass and uh, an older bloom might have a smell that's kind of like rotting garbage, so not very nice. And uh, so if there is blue-green algae present, like there has been in Lake Erie, um, and, and has been seen in some smaller lakes as well, uh, it's really important to avoid use of the water. So this includes swimming, fishing, bathing, and drinking it, of course. 
um, because blue-green algae presents uh, health risks for humans, pets, and wildlife. So it's not safe to let your dog to uh, out to swim in the water as well if there's blue-green algae. And uh, it's interesting that boiling water that has blue-green algae in it doesn't help. So uh, boiling water with blue-green algae actually causes uh, destruction of the cell wall in the algae, which might actually cause the algae to release more toxins. So it can actually make it more dangerous if you're boiling the water. So something to be aware of. And uh, another issue with large algae, algae blooms is that they can cause zones of low oxygen in the lake. So uh, when these large blooms start to die off and break down, the decomposing algae starts uh, consuming oxygen. That's uh, what that process does. And uh, so we're actually seeing dead zones in the central basin of Lake Erie right now. So dead zones with uh, no oxygen or very low oxygen. So in uh, 2018, the Canada-Ontario Lake Erie Action Plan was created. This was created by Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, working with several Ontario ministries and uh, several non-government organizations as well. And this plan is aiming to reduce harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie by reducing phosphorus loading. So we talked about excessive nutrients. So uh, one of those is phosphorus. Um, so this plan also wants to make sure that there's in um, effective legislation in place and uh, build awareness and also strengthening coordination between agencies to try to tackle this massive problem. And uh, it really stresses in the plan that action needs to be taken now to save Lake Erie. Now I know we're the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. Um, and Lake Huron isn't necessarily facing these same problems that Lake Erie is facing right now, at least not on the same scale. We do have a larger and a deeper lake. Um, but even though we aren't facing these problems right now, it's really important that we're taking similar actions to protect our lake from these types of issues in the future. Pathogens are another uh, issue, another impact on water quality in the Great Lakes and in Lake Huron. And uh, so pathogens are disease-causing microorganisms, so like bacteria, viruses, and uh, they often come from fecal waste of animals and humans. And uh, so where are they coming from? Uh, well, some are coming from improperly functioning septic systems, uh, maybe leaky sewer lines, um, some boat sanitary disposal issues uh, from farm animal and pet waste, of course, and uh, sometimes uh, sewage bypass events. So unfortunately, um, municipal sewage bypass events are a fairly common occurrence during extreme rainfall events. And uh, we talked about how climate change is causing more extreme rainfall events. Um, so that's something to be aware of as climate change is becoming an issue as well. Um, so for example, um, these sewage bypass events have been found to happen uh, once or twice a year in the municipality of uh, South Huron, for example. but um, so there's been untreated raw sewage entering the Asable River at, um, from one of the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, but this is just an example and it's uh, definitely not the only place that this is happening. So that uh, can contribute to um, pathogens entering uh, the Great Lakes. Now E. coli is um, popular topic. It's a subgroup of fecal coliform bacteria and it is naturally found in the intestines of warm-blooded animals, so cows, chickens, pigs, dogs, cats, birds, and even people. Uh, and it enters the environment through feces. And um, so studies at a lot of different beaches throughout the Great Lakes are indicating that uh, E. coli found in lake water originates from a variety of different sources. But uh, the main sources of E. coli in the Great Lakes uh, seems to be a bird, so like geese and gulls, uh, faulty septic systems, sewage bypasses, urban runoff, and agricultural runoff. And uh, the proportion of E. coli from the, each of these different sources varies from beach to beach, depending on what's going on in the area around that beach. So how much urban development there is, how much agricultural activity there is, and uh, how many birds are living in that area. So that can really change things. If we're looking at um, 
the near shore of the Canadian side of Lake Huron, if we're looking at um, ankle depth to chest depth lake water, um, studies are showing that the primary sources of E. coli in that area are from uh, agriculture and from geese and gulls. And uh, studies have been done as well in uh, the Toronto and Hamilton areas of uh, Lake Ontario. And um, in ankle depth to chest depth water, the primary sources are gulls and geese. And um, if you're looking out into the deeper water, the primary sources of E. coli are found to be municipal wastewater. And um, so there are thousands of different strands of E. coli, but uh, most of them fortunately are not pathogenic. So they're um, not dangerous to people. Um, and it's interesting to note that the E. coli present in humans doesn't cause diseases in people. So toxic contaminants. These um, toxins are substances that can harm both aquatic and human life. And uh, they're created by a wide variety of human practices and, and products like heavy metals, pesticides, and organic compounds like uh, PCBs. Um, these can include oil, grease, gasoline from roadways, uh, chemicals used in homes, gardens, yards, on farm crops. Um, these are all sources of toxic contaminants. And uh, many of these are resistant uh, to breaking down and they tend to be passed through the food chain. So they move up throughout the food chain and be, um, end up being concentrated in top predators. Road salt is an uh, interesting one. It's uh, been coming up in the media lately, I've been noticing, um, and something to be aware of for sure. Uh, so road salt it can be washed into our storm sewers uh, through runoff, uh, through rain and snow melt, and uh, it's entering our waterways. We're using so much of it, and it's actually being found to enter the groundwater supply too, so our drinking water. Um, and uh, I've done some work myself um, studying water quality in the Lake Ontario area. And uh, so spots in Lake Ontario that are really heavily urbanized, so around the greater Toronto area, uh, some of those areas have become so salty that um, there have actually been sightings of saltwater animals living in freshwater creeks. So I don't know if any of you um, know where Mimico Creek is, but um, they've actually found saltwater blue crabs living in this creek, which is uh, very interesting. Um, the, one of the issues with, um, with salt entering our fresh waterways is uh, that it's been found to stop the growth of salmon species at their most important life stage, and it can actually kill a lot of sensitive species like our freshwater shrimp, uh, mussels, and insects. And our freshwater ecosystems rely on these animals, so salt can actually cause major damages to the entire food web and the overall aquatic ecosystem. And uh, the over-application of road salt is is very common and uh, unnecessary. Um, I understand that road salt is, is definitely important uh, for making sure um, that people are safe, but uh, oftentimes we're, we're applying too much and, uh, and it's not needed. Uh, sedimentation is another issue with uh, water quality in the Great Lakes. So sediment is the loose uh, sand, clay, silt, uh, soil particles that are settling at the bottom of a body of water. And sediment can come from uh, soil erosion or from decomposition of plants and animals. And uh, wind, water, and ice uh, carry these particles into our waterways. And uh, so sediment can come from natural erosion, of course, but uh, the majority of it is actually from accelerated erosion caused by human uses of land. So this could include construction activities, agricultural practices. And uh, sediment degrades water quality. It fills up our storm drains. Uh, it decreases water clarity, of course. It can prevent natural vegetation from growing. And uh, it causes disruptions to the food chain and can actually transport um, excess nutrients and contaminants as well throughout the waterways. So um, that's an issue. And you can see, um, hopefully you can see in this photo here, there's um, uh, quite a bit of sediment exiting uh, this river here into Lake Huron. 
Another issue that's been big in the media in the past few years is plastic pollution, of course. And uh, so this is definitely a threat to our water quality. Ocean pollution has been a big topic of discussion. And uh, unfortunately, our Great Lakes are facing many of the same challenges. Now, hopefully you were able to catch our previous webinar on plastic pollution. Uh, but if not, it will be online as well. And, uh, but basically 400 million tons of plastic is produced every single year. And in Canada, only 9% of our plastics are recycled. And unfortunately, Lake Huron is receiving around 600 metric tons of plastic pollution annually. So that's, that's a real problem because plastics break down into smaller and smaller fragments called microplastics, but they never fully disappear from our environment. The so microplastics are small pieces of plastic. Uh, we're looking at pieces less than five millimeters in diameter. And this can include microfibers, uh, broken down pieces of larger items, and manufactured small plastic items like microbeads and uh, nurdles. And these microplastics have been found inside of fish. They've even been found inside of tiny microscopic plankton. And uh, even recently, we've seen in the news that uh, we're finding microplastics in raindrops and snow, even in very remote places like the Arctic. Now, during our water sampling that we did last year in Lake Huron, we found microfibers in 91% of our samples. Uh, these microfibers are tiny plastic fibers that are shed from clothing, and uh, they couldn't actually be seen until you got the water under a microscope. They're so small that um, they're often being missed during the wastewater treatment process. And uh, another issue with microplastics as well that's uh, a big impact on our water quality is that they attract uh, toxic persistent organic pollutants or POPs to their surface. So these POPs stick to the surface of the plastic almost like a magnet. Botulism. Uh, this is another issue that uh, sometimes makes the media. Now this is a, a paralytic condition that's brought on by the consumption of a naturally occurring toxin. Um, so it's produced by a bacterium. And there are two types that are affecting wildlife in the Great Lakes region. So there's type C and type E botulism. And uh, type E is the one we're seeing the most, and it's connected with the consumption of fish. So it's mainly occurring in gulls, uh, loons, mergansers, swans, and other shorebirds. And it's found in um, the bottom muds and the sediment. And uh, aquatic uh, invertebrates uh, consume this, and then uh, it works its way up the food chain. So the botulism bacterium um, is in the invertebrates, and then fish uh, end up eating the invertebrates, and then shorebirds might end up eating that fish and ingesting um, the bacterium. And this can often result in a large-scale die-off of fish or birds, which then uh, might wash up on our beaches. So a particularly large outbreak was observed in the Kettle Point to Bayfield area of Lake Huron back in uh, 1999, and around 600 birds were found dead uh, during that outbreak. Um, botulism occurrence might be related to hot and dry summers and low lake levels, uh, which may be optimal conditions for the growth of the botulism bacterium, but uh, further research is needed on this. And uh, so type E botulism can pose um, a serious threat to our water bird populations, but um, there's not a major public health concern with this since um, fish eating birds aren't usually eaten by people and thorough cooking does uh, destroy the toxin, fortunately. So next I'd uh, like to talk about some different ways that we assess water quality. So now we know what some of the threats are to our water quality, but uh, now how do, we, how do we assess our water quality? Well, water temperature is one of the most important characteristics of an aquatic ecosystem. It affects the chemical processes, the biological processes, it affects species composition, it affects water density and stratification, and it also affects um, the environmental cues for wildlife. So uh, temperature might cue something like fish spawning and tell uh, fish that it's time to spawn. Um, the most important source of heat uh, for fresh water is generally the sun, of course, 
um, but it also can be affected by the temperature of water inputs. So um, temperature of precipitation, surface, wa surface water runoff, uh, groundwater, or water coming from upstream tributaries. And uh, Great Lakes temperature can also be affected by heat exchanges with the air and uh, evaporation or condensation. And uh, also us humans can be impacting the um, temperature of the Great Lakes. Uh, so this could be from uh, discharge of cooling water from industry, uh, from agriculture, from forest harvesting as well. Um, so if you're removing forests, you're removing shade. So you might be increasing um, water temperature of some of the tributaries to Lake Huron. Um, human activities can also include um, urban development that alter the characteristics and paths of our stormwater runoff. And then, of course, we've talked about climate change as well, and that can change um, the the temperature of our Great Lakes. Uh, another physical indicator that we're looking at for uh, water quality is something called turbidity. Now turbidity is the cloudiness or haziness of a fluid caused by suspended sol solids or sediment that uh, is in that fluid. So low turbidity means that the water is fairly clear and high turbidity means that the water would look cloudy and has more suspended solids in it. And uh, so you can measure turbidity fairly easily out in the field with something called a secchi disc. Um, and there is a photo hopefully that you can see on your screen of that. So this is a round disc and um, it's very inexpensive and it's a straightforward method of measuring water clarity. So you attach this round disc to a rope or a pole and then you lower it down into the water. And uh, once, once that disc gets to a depth where you can't see it anymore, it's no longer visible, that depth is then recorded as the secchi depth. And uh, so another method of measuring water clarity or turbidity is uh, in the lab. So you can do a test uh, for total suspended solids or TSS. Uh, to do this, water samples are measured out and uh, then you run the water through a very fine filter and any solid materials are then captured and left on that filter. And uh, so these solids could include anything that's drifting or floating in the water. So it could include sediment, silt, and sand. Um, but then that filter will still be wet. Uh, so then it needs um, to be dried out in a kind of oven. So all the water is completely gone. And uh, so once those filters are dry, then uh, you weigh them. And that gives you a number in milligrams per liter. And you can compare those numbers with other water samples to determine water clarity. Um, hopefully you can see on your screen uh, the bottom right there has a picture of some filters that have been used to measure total suspended solids or TSS. You can see those, those solids that are left on the filter. And you can also measure something called total dissolved solids, or TDS. And this is a measure of inorganic or organic substances that are present in water in a dissolved form. So these particles are very, very small. And uh, usually they're coming from agricultural and urban runoff and industrial or, or urban point source pollution. Um, TDS, or total dissolved solids, is often measured out in the field pretty easily using a device called a conductivity meter or a TDS meter. And uh, so it uses electrical uh, conductivity to calculate the concentration of dissolved ionized solids in the water. So the, um, these solids create the ability for the water to conduct an electric current. So if there's more things in the water, more solids in the water, um, it's going to be easier for that electric current to move through the water. So that's how you get those numbers. Now let's move on uh, to the chemical indicators of water quality. We've already talked a lot uh, tonight so far about nutrients and contaminants and salinity and um, salt content as being an issue for water quality. But uh, another important indicator is dissolved oxygen. So the amount of oxygen that dissolves in water can vary in daily seasonal patterns and uh, it also decreases with higher temperature. So cold water can hold more dissolved oxygen than warm water can. And uh, fresh water can hold more dissolved oxygen than salt water, which is interesting. Um, so dissolved oxygen comes from the atmosphere. So when there are wavy conditions in the lake, for example, 
and uh, it also comes from aquatic plants. So these plants are, um, when they're photosynthesizing, they're producing oxygen. But when these plants start to die off and decompose, oxygen is consumed, so they're using up the oxygen in the water. And uh, remember what I said earlier about large algae blooms decomposing and uh, causing dead zones with very low oxygen levels in the lake. And dissolved oxygen is essential for a healthy aquatic ecosystem. Our fish and aquatic animals, they need this oxygen dissolved in the water to survive. Um, but it's interesting that the need for oxygen depends on the species and the life stage that the species is at. So some animals are adapted to lower oxygen conditions and others require higher oxygen levels. Um, for example, um, it's interesting that Ontario's turtle species can survive um, very well in low oxygen conditions, especially snapping turtles. They can survive in almost zero oxygen conditions. And of course, there are also uh, biological indicators that are looked at when we're assessing water quality. So we're looking at um, contents uh, of bacteria and algae when we're assessing water quality. And these biological indicators are often studied by our local health units and also the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. In Ontario, regular monitoring of public beaches is undertaken by either municipal or county health units. Um, so there are potentially many different pathogenic or disease causing organisms that can impact our water quality. And I mentioned before that a lot of these are associated with fecal contamination. Um, but health units uh, don't have the capability or the resources to test for the presence of every single possible pathogen out there. So they use E. coli as an indicator for the possible presence of pathogens. So generally, E. coli is not pathogenic or dangerous to humans, um, though some strains obviously are, but um, the presence of E. coli in recreational waters, especially at high levels, has been uh, taken to indicate fecal contamination in general. And, um, and then that's saying that there's likely other pathogens present that could be there. Now, the frequency of sampling by the health units varies among the different jurisdictions, but all of the health units follow the same protocols for how to, sa how to sample and how to analyze those samples to determine when they're um, recommending be beach postings or swim advisories. Uh, usually five water samples are taken from each beach and uh, then they take these water samples back to the lab and they incubate them and uh, try to grow cultures of E. coli. And it actually takes about 24 hours uh, for, to process the results from the previous day's water testing. So when you're getting the results um, on beach postings, uh, that's because of water samples that were taken the day before. Uh, Ontario actually has the world's most strict recreational water quality guidelines for posting beaches um, for E. coli levels. Um, so Health Canada's recreational water quality standard is um, 200 E. coli per 100 milliliters of lake water. And uh, so this guideline has been adopted by all of the provinces now in Canada. Um, so basically, the higher the number of E. coli colonies above 200, the higher the risk of becoming ill when swimming in that water. Now, um, other countries have different thresholds for posting beaches. So, uh, for example, the U U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's guideline is uh, 236 E. coli per 100 milliliters of lake water. So um, just a little bit higher than ours. Uh, but the European Union actually classifies freshwater beaches as having poor water quality if levels of E. coli are greater than 900 E. coli per 100 milliliters of water. So it's quite a bit higher their threshold for um, beach closures. Now, um, the Huron County Health Unit samples at 14 different locations in the county, and uh, they do this twice a week. So they go out uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, according to their website. Uh, Lambton County goes uh, to seven different locations, and they go out every single weekday. And uh, Gray Bruce Health Unit samples once a month, and they go to 12 different beaches in their county. So this might seem a little bit infrequent, um, 
And you have to keep in mind this 24 hour period that it takes to process the results from their sampling. But uh, there are a couple of things that you can look at yourself to help decide if it's safe to swim or not. So you can make an informed choice. So the first thing that you'd want to look at is whether there's been heavy rainfall in the past 24 to 48 hours. And if there has been, there might be a higher risk um, of, of um, bacteria when you're swimming. And uh, so the second thing you want to look at is how turbid the water is. So if you can't see your feet when you're standing at weight, waist depth in the water, it might not be safe to swim. So you want, you want to be able to see your feet. And uh, it's important to remember also that the water quality in Lake Huron can change dramatically from day to day, from even hour to hour, or even from minute to minute with heavy rainfall with, or with um, high wave action or both. So if things are getting stirred up. Um, hopefully, uh, most of you heard, have heard about the Spills Action Center, but uh, if not, if you um, suspect a blue-green algae bloom, or if you're concerned about uh, pollution or spills impacting water quality in Ontario, you can actually contact the Ministry of the Environment Spills Action Center, and uh, the phone number is on the screen. It's 1-866-MOE-TIPS. So you can call them if you see uh, pollution spilled on the land or in the water or even in the air. If you're seeing um, waste being dumped into the natural environment or impro improper disposal of commercial waste. Um, and you can also um, submit complaints about industrial or commercial noise pollution. And uh, you'll speak to an environmental officer if you call them, and they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, they'll ask for information like the date and time of the incident, a source, location of the incident, uh, the type of pollutant that's involved, and what impact that pollutant is having on the environment. And they might also ask you for um, weather conditions uh, like precipitation, temperature, wind direction as well to help them. Uh, investigate. And I've put the website on the screen as well if you want uh, more information on that. Um, so the conservation authorities. There are 36 conservation authorities in Ontario and uh, these are community-based agencies whose mandate is to undertake watershed-based programs to protect people and property from flooding and other natural hazards and to conserve natural resources. And uh, so they're legislated under the Conservation Authorities Act of 1946. And uh, they monitor the health of our natural resources in their watersheds because um, it helps to provide a better understanding of local environmental issues. And then uh, we can focus action where they're needed and track progress over time. So the conservation authorities work with the province to monitor surface water quality in their regions and they go through the standard suite of water quality parameters. So the things that we've already talked about, uh, they're looking at and uh, they do this through the provincial surface water quality monitoring network. Um, so this is also combined with a wide variety of other environmental monitoring programs. So they do things like uh, groundwater monitoring, um, they monitor for benthic macroinvertebrates, uh, fish monitoring, stormwater monitoring, and they also do a lot of rural stormwater management projects. And for those conservation authorities whose jurisdiction involves um, the shoreline of the Great Lakes, many of these uh, undertake extensive monitoring projects, um, like the long-term Durham Region Coastal Wetland Monitoring Project on Lake Ontario. And the conservation authorities also have many important stewardship projects. Uh, so they work with farmers and urban residents to help protect our drinking water and protect the water quality in the Great Lakes. And all of the conservation authorities that are along the shore of Lake Huron participate in a large initiative called Healthy Lake Huron, where they partner with government agencies and non-government organizations like us at the Coastal Center to coordinate action to improve water quality on the southeastern shores of Lake Huron. So that corridor from Sarnia up to Tobermory. And uh, so six key watersheds along the southeastern shores were identified as priorities for immediate action to protect Lake Huron's water quality. And uh, over the past few years, a great deal of effort has gone into implementation of uh, watershed management plans that have been developed for each of these priority sites. 
including uh, specific actions like tree planting projects or erosion control projects. And uh, we've also been doing long-term monitoring in these watersheds um, since the beginning of the project. And uh, the results from this monitoring are starting to show a reduction in pollutants coming out of these watersheds and entering the Great Lakes. So it, it is working. So what are some of the ways that we can improve water quality? Um, there is a lot that can be done in the agricultural industry to help mitigate some of the threats to water quality, um, but I'm not going to get into that tonight since that isn't my area of expertise. But uh, if you would like to learn more about recommended strategies for improving water quality through agricultural practices, I would encourage you to get in touch with your local conservation authority since many of them have um, some programs that can help with this. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about tonight are some ways that you can help protect water quality at home. And this is whether you live on a shoreline or inland. And everything that I'm going to suggest relates back to uh, the concept of low impact development, LID. So low impact development is a stormwater management strategy that seeks to mitigate the impacts of increased runoff and stormwater pollution by managing runoff as close to its source as possible. So filtering, storing, returning stormwater into the ground, that's the goal of low impact development. And uh, effective management of this stormwater is going to be critical to the continued health of our Great Lakes. So the first way um, that you can implement this on your property is by creating a natural filter. So plants within three meters or around 10 feet uh, or more of any lake, stream or ditch can help to stabilize soil. Um, they absorb excess water, they can absorb excess sediment and uh, use up any excess nutrients that are in the runoff. Um, so this is called a vegetated buffer sometimes. And one of the most basic methods of managing runoff besides a small waterway, for example, is to simply stop cutting the grass along either side of the waterway. That's a really easy way to start your own vegetated buffer because even uncut grass can act as a natural water filter. Um, now on the Great Lakes and Lake Huron, especially during times of high water levels, it's critical that we keep vegetation along bluffs and on beaches since this vegetation not only helps to filter runoff, but it helps to slow the process of erosion. And uh, if you'd like more information about how beach dune ecosystems and bluff ecosystems function and the role that vegetation plays in this function, you can uh, check out our webinar on coastal processes once um, this series has been uploaded to our website. So another way of um, creating a natural filter is by installing something called a swale, a vegetated swale, or it's sometimes called a bioswale. And this is a shallow stormwater channel that's planted with native grasses and shrubs. So it helps to slow stormwater discharge and reduce um, the amount of sediment and helps to promote water filtration. So it acts as a natural water filter. And uh, these bioswales have been found to work quite well in managing stormwater runoff in uh, beach areas. And a similar concept is a rain garden. And uh, so a rain garden is a planted depression in a yard that absorbs rainwater from hard surfaces. So if you have a low area in your yard, it doesn't matter if you live on a shoreline or in town, um, you can plant native grasses, wildflowers, and shrubs that thrive in wet conditions in this rain garden. And um, then you can reduce the amount of water that's flowing over your land and flowing into storm drains and across your beach. Um, and these rain gardens also provide habitat for wildlife. So butterflies, dragonflies, frogs, and uh, songbirds all can use uh, your rain garden. Now, if you are um, going to be installing a buffer zone or a bioswale or a rain garden, uh, it's really important to remember to use native plants only. So native plants are those um, that are considered to be indigenous to an area, meaning that they originally or naturally occurred in that area and they've evolved and adapted to the local climate, to the soil and to the wildlife over thousands of years. So these plants are specifically designed to adapt to certain ecological conditions, so shade or extreme uh, sun and temperature that you're finding on, along beaches or um, the different types of topography in the area. 
Uh, so native coastal plants have adapted to extreme elements, um, even adapting to wind and waves and lake effect precipitation. And uh, native plants provide valuable habitat and food sources for birds, butterflies, and other wildlife, of course. And uh, what's interesting is that a lot of our native plants as well, including grasses and wildflowers, they have really deep root systems, which help to absorb excess water, filter out contaminants, and uh, they help to hang on to the soil so they can actually help to slow down the process of erosion. And uh, especially be sure if you're planting uh, to avoid an, any invasive species. And uh, keep in mind that sometimes invasive species are still being sold at garden centers. So just because you're buying it at a garden center doesn't mean that it's going to be um, safe to plant in your rain garden. And uh, so if you want to learn more about this, you can check out, uh, we have a coastal plant guide online and uh, there's more information about which plants are best to use for different coastal habitat types and uh, which ones you might want to avoid. So we've talked a lot about runoff this evening. Um, we haven't talked too much about storm drains in particular. And uh, many people don't actually realize that storm drains are directly connected to our rivers and lake. Uh, in most places, stormwater isn't filtered. It isn't cleaned through the wastewater treatment process. Um, so after storm events runoff that uh, contains contaminants, it goes straight into the storm drain system and uh, straight into the lake. And uh, some of these contaminants can include trash, like cigarette butts, uh, chemicals, fertilizers, oil, antifreeze that's leaking from our vehicles. And um, so every time that uh, we're getting a significant rainfall event, um, the storm drains are delivering all of these contaminants straight into the Great Lakes, straight into our drinking water source. Uh, so you can help with this by sweeping up any dirt, grass clippings, any other materials before they're washed into the storm drain. And uh, of course, making sure to never use storm drains to dispose of waste of any kind, uh, including cleaning products and used oil or paint, of course. Another tip for um, protecting water quality at home is uh, to fertilize responsibly. So if you're going to fertilize your lawn, um, please do this responsibly. And uh, keep in mind that nitrogen is the only nutrient that might need to be applied every year to a lawn. So phosphorus and potassium can actually remain in the soil for years. So it doesn't need to be applied every year. And over applying fertilizer translates to a waste of personal effort, um, excess use of money, you're spending too much on fertilizer, um, it's not doing a whole lot for your grass and it has a huge potential damage to the lake and uh, to the river ecosystems nearby. So an overall negative effect on the watershed. Um, so if you do feel that fertilizing is necessary on your property, um, if you can try to minimize the amount that you use, that's great, and uh, try to be accurate with the application. So um, just try to remember that any excessive nutrients, especially phosphorus, that are entering our water bodies through runoff, these can be contributing to harmful algae blooms. So when we live in uh, lakeside communities, we really need to uh, be responsible with the use of fertilizer. Uh, something else you can uh, try at home is using uh, permeable surfaces. So um, an increase in hardened surfaces on your property prevents water from infiltrating down into the ground. And when water enters the ground, it um, acts as a natural kind of water filter and starts to filter out any contaminants. Um, but if you have hard surfaces on your property, that water and any contaminants are just going to run quickly across the land and not get down into the soil. Um, this can also increase erosion in some areas if water is moving quickly across your land. So permeable surfaces are those types um, that allow rainwater to seep into the ground. So you can use permeable pavers, so you can use gravel or interlocking stones on your driveway, or um, you can actually buy um, special kinds of uh, asphalt now that allow water to seep down into the ground. And uh, so that'll help to reduce water pollution and uh, stormwater runoff. And uh, some of these permeable pavers also offer quite a few other benefits, um, like uh, long-term durability, and uh, this will also help to recharge our groundwater aquifers, which is really important. 
Uh, directing runoff is another thing you can do on your property. Um, so directing runoff on your property can help to slow water, um, slow this runoff, um, and prevent it from reaching storm drains too quickly and allow it to percolate into the ground. Again, we want to get the, the water into the ground so any contaminants can be filtered out before the water enters our uh, Great Lakes. Um, so if you try something like directing rainwater to the middle of your lawn, uh, keeping it away from the foundation of your home, that's helpful. Um, but you can also do something um, like purchase a rain barrel. So you can use a rain barrel to collect um, water uh, that you can then use later in your garden or on your lawn. So saving some money on uh, water bills. And uh, this reduces large volumes of runoff that's uh, coming off your roof. So um, for every inch of rain that falls on a 500 square feet of roof, you can actually collect about 300 gallons of water, which is fairly significant. Uh, poorly maintained septic systems have also been linked uh, to water quality issues in our lakes. Uh, so I've mentioned that before. Uh, so if you do have a septic system, it's really important to learn what can and can't be put into the system. So things like oil, gasoline, paint, some cleaners and cosmetic products products, um, they shouldn't be put into septic systems. And uh, if you can reduce the use of any phosphorus, um, phosphate-based detergents, that will also help to protect water quality. So if you have a septic system on a shoreline, that's really important not to be using any phosphate-based phosphate, um, detergents. And uh, so how often you need to have your system inspected and pumped really depends on um, the size or capacity of your system, the number of people in the house, and how many different water using appliances you, you have. Um, but generally speaking, you should um, probably have your system inspected and pumped out by a qualified professional every um, three to five years or so. Uh, pet waste is another thing uh, some people might not think about. Um, so when the snow melts or when it rains, any pet waste that's on your property can be washed uh, into storm drains and uh, into ditches and into local waterways. And this pet waste can contain bacteria, uh, potential pathogens, and nutrients, of course. And um, this can impact opportunities for swimming, fishing, and other lake activities activities and um, the pet waste can actually contribute to the growth of aquatic plants and algae. And I know it might not seem like a big deal if your uh, dog is contributing some waste to the environment, um, but if you think about uh, how many homes do have pets in Canada, um, it's, it's quite a lot uh, when you add it all up. Um, automated or coin operated car washes are also um, something you can do uh, to be more lake friendly. They're generally more lake friendly than washing your car at home since um, the soapy water that's used at the car wash is uh, then directed to the wastewater treatment plant for cleaning. Um, but if you are washing your vehicles at home on your own property, um, again, trying to use uh, phosphate-free soaps is great. And uh, using a bucket to wash your vehicle and uh, rinsing with a hose that has a sprayer attached um, to conserve water is great. Um, and if you think about it, if you're washing something on your driveway, uh, the soap and water is going to find its way fairly quickly into the storm drain and into local lakes and rivers. So if you can direct any water and soap uh, towards a vegetated surface, like washing your car on your lawn, um, this will encourage the infiltration of that wash water into the ground and uh, trap any sediments and, and filter it out a little bit. And, uh, and this is, um, this is great, then we're, we're keeping soap and uh, other things out of our storm drains. And if you do look um, at the storm drains in your neighborhood, if you take a look at them, um, they can be a good indicator of what kind of land use practices are happening on properties in your community that might need to be changed. So if you're seeing cooling, soapy water, and organic material um, piled up in the storm drain, it might be an indicator that um, some practices need to be changed in your neighborhood to help uh, protect our Great Lake. And uh, my last tip for protecting water quality at home is uh, to reduce the use of road salt wherever possible. So we've talked about uh, why um, road salt is an issue in the Great Lakes. And uh, the key to eco-friendly de-icing is um, to use only as much as you need. Or you can um, also try using a less harmful alternative to road salt. 
Um, so just keep in mind that adding extra salt doesn't melt the ice any faster. And um, to help protect your lake, you can avoid salting surfaces that aren't used or where sunlight's generally melting the ice fairly quickly. Um, and you can try alternatives like uh, sawdust or wood chips, or um, there are some natural products out there containing baking soda or corn fiber. Um, but be aware as well that even uh, some de-icers out there are labeled as eco-friendly, but uh, they may contain chemicals that can harm lakes and aquatic life and our plants. Um, also keeping in mind that uh, when you shovel, uh, that makes a difference. So if you're shoveling as soon as possible after a snowstorm, uh, that will help to avoid uh, compaction of the snow and ice formation. So hopefully then you're, again, you're not needing to use quite as much road salt. Uh, so that's it. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, so um, I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can, um, if you do have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A box. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of minutes if anyone does want to enter some questions. Um, but uh, while we wait, I'd just like to again say thank you for participating in tonight's webinar. Um, we really appreciate uh, how many people have been interested in attending this series. It's been great. And uh, again, uh, thank you to our sponsors, um, RBC and Bruce Power. And uh, as a registered charity, without these uh, sponsorships and without donations, we wouldn't be able to run our programs, um, all of our different programs that we run to protect and restore Lake Huron. Uh, so we do also um, always welcome donations and that can be made on our website at uh, lakehuron.ca. And um, so I don't see any questions coming up right now, but uh, if you do think of anything afterwards that you'd like to ask, you can always uh, contact our staff by email as well. It's uh, coastalcenter at lakehuron.ca, where you can always uh, stop by our office uh, on the square in Goderich, uh, or you can always give us a call if you have any questions. And uh, we do um, a lot on our social media as well. So you can uh, check out our Facebook page, uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, yeah, so I don't see any questions that have come through yet. Um, but uh, hopefully you can join us for our next webinar. Uh, so that will be the final one in the series. And it happens September 11th at uh, 7 p.m. And it will be led by Patrick Donnelly, our Coastal Science and Stewardship Advisor. And uh, he's going to be talking about climate change. So that will be a really interesting episode. And uh, all of the details are available on our website at lakehuron.ca slash upcoming events. Uh, so thank you again and have a great night.